We started vectors with section 6.6 because that's where some of the basic definitions were. We identified vectors as a directed line segment, and the magnitude of a vector is a scalar quantity equal to its length. Our book uses absolute value as being synonymous with magnitude, and so it uses the symbol with one set of lines. And I have always found that confusing, so I will be using the two sets of lines to indicate magnitude to differentiate it from absolute value. Now, the other thing that's in there is the word scalar. A scalar value has magnitude but no direction. It's just a number. Seven is bigger than five. It doesn't matter what direction you're going. Two vectors are equal if and only if two things are true if they have the same magnitude and the same direction. They don't have to be in the same place. Now here's the deal about the sum of two vectors. The book defines it graphically. The book says the sum of two vectors is what happens when you translate them such that the head of one is in the same place as the tail of the other. And then essentially, what happens is you're talking about a shortcut, right? One, that's V, right? There's V and W. Of course, you could go that way, or you could just take the shortcut. By the way, the tail is the beginning of the, of the vector. The head is the end of the vector, and the head is where the arrow head is. A vector can be expressed in two ways. You can give its magnitude and direction, where the direction is given as an angle in standard position, meaning that uh, the vector itself is the terminal side of the angle, and the other side of the angle is the x-axis. Uh, the other way you can identify a vector is by giving component form. And in com component form, it looks like xi plus yj. The thing to remember is that in this context, x and y are scalar numbers. They're just numbers. They're not even variables. They're constants. x is the number of spaces you'll go in the x direction, and y is the number of spaces you'll go in the y direction because i and j are unit vectors pointing horizontally and vertically, respectively. In order to get the magnitude of a vector that is in component form, you use the Pythagorean theorem, even if it's in third dimension. So there's a three-dimensional form of the Pythagorean theorem, and this is it. We're still sort of just working through the framework of, of the definitions, right? The next definition has to do with the opposite of a vector. Remember, a vector has a direction and a magnitude. The opposite vector has the same length, but it's pointed in the opposite direction. That's it. It doesn't have to be in the same place. Right? It could be anywhere, but it's pointed in the opposite direction, and it has the same length. Position vectors. Up until this moment, whenever you wanted to give the position of a point, you gave a horizontal and a vertical component. You said, these many spaces over, these many spaces up or down. You said x comma y. The position vector is the vector that goes from the origin, or in the case of this, you call it the pole, right? from wherever your reference point is, your central point, and it goes from there to the point. So this vector, which has a direction and a magnitude, describes the position of this point relative to this point, the origin, the pole, in the same way that x comma y would. Every point has a position vector. You can identify any point on a plane either with x comma y or with a vector, a position vector. Displacement is a word that seems to have been causing some concern. Displacement just means moved. When you displace something, you move it. You take it out of its place. 
a displacement vector identifies what direction you moved it and how far you moved it. It identifies the displacement with a direction and a magnitude. If you know the position vectors of the start and finish of these two things, you can get the description of the displacement vector by subtracting the end point minus the starting point. If you're trying to remember, is it V2 minus V1 or is it V1 minus V2? Simplify your life. You're sitting on a number line. You're sitting at 2. You want to go to 4. That will take a, a, a displacement of positive 2. Would that be 4 minus 2 or 2 minus 4? Oh, that would be 4 minus 2. So it must be where I end up minus where I start. The dot product is a scalar number. It is not a vector, it's a scalar. And the dot product of two vectors is the product of the magnitude of the two vectors times the cosine of the angle between the two vectors when set tail to tail. Doesn't mean you have to move them to get the dot product. It just means that if you moved them, there would be an angle. That is the definition of dot product. But you can also, if you have two vectors a and b in component form, get the dot product by multiplying the coefficients of the components of the two vectors. All right, we talked about projection vectors. This is what they're for, or at least one of the things they're for. If you're dragging something along the way this guy is, and the rope you're pulling on is pointed up and forward, some of the work you're doing is pulling the box up, and some of it is pulling the box forward. If you want to know what portion, what component of his work is actually moving the box forward, that is represented by a projection vector. If A represents the force that's being applied by the guy who's pulling the string, P, the projection vector, is the component of that vector that's moving in the direction of B, which is forward. And you draw a line from the head of the vector you are projecting to the vector you're projecting it onto at a 90 degree angle. We are projecting A onto B. From the head of A, I draw a, a perpendicular segment to B. And you will know how long P is, the projection. You could think of it as if you knew the XY coordinates of this point, you're looking for the X value. The other one is how much you're pulling up instead of forward. Now, since B and P as vectors are both pointing in the same direction, it turns out P is really just a scalar multiple of B. You just have to figure out what the scale is. The direction is fixed. And the value of the scalar will be the ratio of the lengths of the projection and the vector you're projecting on. And it looks like this. The length of the vector B is the magnitude of B. The length of P is also the magnitude of P, but we don't know what it is. We do know that it is equal to the magnitude of A times the cosine of theta, which means if you take B and multiply it by that magnitude, you get the description of P. This tells you what P is. It is some portion of B, with that portion being defined by the ratio between the length of P and the length of B. So there you go. In this case, P represents the portion of the effort spent in pulling that actually goes toward moving the box forward. By the way, if you were using dot products, you could use dot products to get this as well. You can express the magnitude of P by getting the dot product of A and B and dividing it by the magnitude squared of B. One more definition. A vector is normal to a plane if it is perpendicular to the plane. That's what the word means. A normal vector is perpendicular. The process of finding the equation of a plane is very much like what you did in Algebra 1 when you were given a point and a line and you were told, find the line through this point that is parallel to this line. 
or here's a point and a line, find the line that goes through this point that is perpendicular to this line. You have a reference line and a point, and that's enough to identify the perpendicular and the parallel lines. And the way you did that was you figured out the slope, you put it into y equals mx plus b, you didn't know what b was, so you plugged in the values of the point that you had to calculate b, and then you put it all back together so that it was an equation y equals mx plus b. It's exactly what you're going to do here. If you have a vector that is normal to the plane you're trying to get the equation for, and if you have that vector in component form, then you have something like ai plus bj plus ck, right? You can take that abc and plug it into the equation form for the plane, and that will give you an equation for the plane, but only if you pick the right d. Okay. The way you get the right d is by taking a point from that plane, plugging it in, getting the value of d, and then going back and writing it as an equation. Cross product. Cross product is a vector that meets all three of the following conditions. And remember, describing a vector, we can identify it by stating its direction and its magnitude, and that's what we're going to do now. The cross product is a vector, and it is the vector that is normal to the plane that is created by the two vectors. If you have two vectors, you have at least three points, and that's enough to create a plane. Now, saying that it's normal to the plane doesn't actually give you the complete thing about the direction. If I say here is a vector that is normal to this plane, I'm not telling you whether the vector points up or points down. For that, you need the right-hand rule. And what the right-hand rule says is, if you put your hand in the direction of the first vector in such a way that when you curl your fingers, you are indicating where the other one is, your thumb will be pointing in the direction of the vector. So that's the direction of the vector. How do you get the magnitude? The magnitude of the cross product of two vectors is equal to the product of the magnitude of the vectors times the sine of the angle between them when the two angles are set tail to tail. That actually tells you that cross product is not commutative. A cross B does not equal B cross A. If you have A cross B and B cross A, those will be opposite vectors. They'll have the same magnitude, but they won't be pointing the same direction. You can also calculate a cross product by using the determinants of matrices created with the coefficients of, of the components. And it looks like this. The cross product of A and B is equal to I times the determinant of one two by two matrix minus J times the determinant of the other two by two matrix plus K times the determinant of a third two by two matrix with the two by two matrices being formed from the coefficients of the components of vector A and vector B. The matrix written like this without the brackets, this is the determinant of this matrix. So now here's the deal. With both dot products and cross products, we talked about the definition and then we talked about ways to calculate them using component form. If you have two vectors, in component form, and you have the cross product or the dot product, you can calculate the angle between them. Let's do the cross product first. This is the one we were just looking at. You have two ways to calculate the cross product of two vectors. One of them presumes that you know the components of, of all of them, and the other one presumes that it's in, it's in magnitude and direction form. If you have two vectors, and you have them in component form, and you have the value of the cross product, that's enough information to get you the angle between the two vectors. The cross product of A cross B can be written in this kind of component form, and the definition of the magnitude of A cross B 
is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle, you can find the magnitude of A and the magnitude of B if it's written in a component form. So you now have three of the four numbers that are here, and all you have to do is use an, an inverse trig function in order to get theta. And the same exact thing happens with dot products. Right? If you have two vectors in component form, you have a method for finding the dot product that involves multiplying the coefficients together and adding them up. You also have the definition of the dot product. So if, in fact, you know what the dot product is, you can take the dot product calculated one way, make it equal to the dot product calculated the other way with the angle as your variable, and then solve for the angle. This all sounds familiar, right? If you have two vectors, the magnitude of the cross product is the area of the parallelogram that has the two vectors as adjacent sides. So if you have two vectors and they're set tail to tail, that makes an angle, and side lengths you know, you can finish that parallelogram. The magnitude of the cross product of those two vectors is the area of the parallelogram.